all team sports are good for kids, but we really do feel that hockey is different. It's unique and differentiated. I truly believe it's the greatest team sport on earth. And I think some of the differences are, it just seems to be that the team go beyond yourself. You're willing to go beyond yourself. You're willing to put all personal agendas aside for the good of the team. I think you learn this from the time you start the sport and that's the goodness in the game that we want to keep moving forward. Welcome to the Midland Money Mindset Show. This is a podcast about the financial, money, and recreational mindset needed to successfully plan for and live your best life before and through retirement. Let's dive into today's show. I'm Larry Sprung, your host for the Midland Money Mindset and founder and wealth advisor of Midland Financial. Today's guest is Mary Kay Messier, member of the Bauer Hockey Senior Leadership Team as Vice President of Global Marketing. Mary Kay oversees all of Bauer's global marketing efforts, including digital, social, consumer experiences, and sports marketing and strategic partnerships, which include those with the NHL, NHLPA, international federations, and pro athletes. Mary Kay is a committed and effective advocate for the game with the goal of making it more accessible, inclusive, diverse, and focused on fun. Because after all, that's what it's all about. Mary Kay and her team created the internationally successful First Shift program. Now in partnership with the NHL, NHLPA, and founding partner Hockey Canada, the First Shift has welcomed over 30 thousand new families to hockey. That is what I would consider growing the game. Listen in as Mary Kay and I talk about hockey, growing the game, and the huge expansion of the sport through women's hockey. Well, hello, everybody. Larry Sprung here. And as you know, I am a huge hockey fan, and I have the pleasure today of being with Mary Kay Messier, who is a member of the Bauer Hockey Senior Leadership Team, and she is the Vice President of Global Marketing. Thanks for joining us today, Mary Kay. Thank you very much for having me, Larry. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for taking out the time. So everybody wants to know, people who are involved in hockey, people that I know personally, we all know Bauer, my kids use your gear. We want to know about what's your path to becoming the VP of Marketing at Bauer Hockey? How does that happen? Gee, well, I've been in hockey my whole life. So similar to you, I have kids that play hockey, but my father played pro and my two brothers played pro hockey. So I feel like I've been immersed in hockey my whole life. I had many different roles outside of hockey. And eventually at some point in my life, the all roads led back that way. And I took a couple of different positions for companies. One was helping Cascade Sports introduce their revolutionary liner technology for a helmet to the hockey market, which was really exciting. And also just raising awareness for concussion and what people should be aware of. And after three years, that company was acquired by Bauer Hockey. So I first came on with Bauer to lead a global initiative to grow the game, which I'm very, very passionate about. And just over time, my role evolved to take on more marketing functions, including sports marketing and the creative team and a number of other functions to where I'm at today. So it's it's been kind of a journey getting to this place, but I'm still very, very passionate about the cause-related initiatives that we lead specifically on growing the game and making it more inclusive and diverse. Yeah, we'll definitely get into that in our conversation because as, as people who've listened to me talk and I, I've been on shows, I've talked about it on my show, I'm all about growing the game of hockey. One of the best stories I have is a couple, I guess three years ago now, my wife and I headed out to Vegas when Vegas was in the Western Conference Finals with the Winnipeg Jets. And we were walking down the street, going to the game, or even it might have even been the day before the game. And the streets were crowded and people were wearing Vegas Knights jerseys. People were wearing Jets jerseys. Half the people didn't even know what hockey was, but they thought it was awesome. And they thought it was great that they were going to be able to go see the game. And I remember looking at my wife. I'm like, this is unbelievable. This is great for hockey, period. And that's what it's all about. 
And uh, by the way, I have a Cascade helmet. I oh, bought it because oh, my family M11. was concerned. Yes, I do. I have an M11. My family was concerned playing men's league about concussion and whatnot. So I ended up buying one uh, when they, I guess now it's a relic because they don't make them anymore. But Well, we took it under Bauer. So it's, right. it's kind of a Bauer version of that. The best of both. Yes, all in there. So listen, 2021 was a huge milestone for professionals women's hockey and the growing of the game. You launched the Secret Dream Gap Tour. Can you tell us what this was for, for those that may have missed it? Sure. So the Secret Dream Gap Tour is really the result of the PWHPA, which for people that don't know, it was a union of women hockey players that decided to stand together to unite together to advocate for a true professional women's league, which means the appropriate resources, training, facilities, and as importantly, marketing for their game to be able to take their world-class product to a world-class stage, which meant really partnerships with NHL clubs, they're playing in the right venues, and really importantly, being nationally broadcast. So it was really about that mission to secure this league uh, for the best players in the world. Was it a full season? What was the game plan for the league and getting this thing jump started? Well, I will say before COVID, it probably looked a lot differently. We were making a lot of progress and then COVID hit. And a lot of times, unfortunately, these types of initiatives are put on hold. And so it was really hard to get it jump started again. Most NHL clubs were operating with really reduced teams with budgets slashed. And I guess very fortunately, we were able to tap into a couple of the bigger markets and teams that really understood that these are the types of initiatives that really can't be put on hold. You can't, you know, once you start that momentum, if you lose it, it's really hard to kickstart it again. So we started conversations with the Rangers, Chicago Blackhawks, the Toronto Maple Leafs, uh, the St. Louis Blues, all who have significant investments in growing girls hockey, both from a participation standpoint, as well as their community. And eventually we got to a place to say this is something that really couldn't be put on hold and we needed to move forward. So from there, it really became a journey to figure out how to get that done in such trying circumstances. So it was amazing to see it come together. I think it took Herculean effort and commitment from the partners. And then it was amazing to see all their partners in the way of sponsors get involved and jump on the train to support. And from there, it was really about securing broadcast. So the games were nationally broadcast in the U.S., NHL Network and NBC, and then in Canada, also uh, broadcast nationally on Sportsnet. So really, really an exciting time. Yeah, that I mean, that's amazing. And I will tell you in full disclosure, my sister to this day talks to my dad and is upset with him because he never let her play because wow. I started, I picked up the game at the age of like nine or 10. And my sister was a soccer player and she, I remember being kids and she asked a few times about playing hockey and he was like, oh, you're a soccer player, play soccer. And to this day, she's like, I always wanted to play, but I never had the opportunity. So now her kids are playing and she's kind of experiencing it through that. But 20, 30, even 40 years ago, women's ice hockey was not what it is today. And, uh, you know, thanks to efforts like these, it's really expanding the depth and breadth of the game to women's hockey for sure. Absolutely. Your sister's experience is very much in line with a lot of women at that time uh, not really being offered the opportunity. A lot of times they were little sisters sneaking into their brother's gear or following them to the rink. But the women that did start to make it, really their sacrifice was unbelievable. A lot of times, you know, if you look at Marie Philippe Plant in Canada, needing to move far away from home as a young girl, probably 14 years old, to play in an all-boys league, it's pretty daunting. And the opportunities were few and far between. So to just to your point that your sister's girls are playing hockey is a real testament to where we've gone. Now, some girls are still playing in boys leagues, but there are a lot more associations that offer all girls hockey. And I think importantly, that's part of what the PWHPA and the Secret Dream Gap Tour is. If she sees it, she can be it. And seeing this representation at the very highest level of the game makes girls realize that the opportunity is open, that they can pursue their dream to the highest level. So that's really exciting in terms of where we're going. 
Yeah, hundred percent. Actually, uh, guys that I played high school hockey with, one of them in particular had a, a daughter that played, and they put together a league in Westchester. I think Westchester or Rockland, New York, and yeah. they started putting it together a couple years ago. And they could not believe the number of girls that came out. It was like oversubscribed. Yeah. It was just again, you know, anything that puts more people on the ice, men, yeah. women, whatever, is good for the game of hockey. Period. So completely agree. You touched on it a little bit earlier, but how does the fact that these games were looking to be or played at hockey meccas like New York, Mm. Chicago, St. Louis, and Toronto, does that in itself help the game? Because these are iconic hockey cities that are now putting women's hockey on display. Amazing. I mean, New York is the media capital of the world, and Toronto is Canada's version of New York. But to play at Madison Square Garden, it was a moment in history. It was what I call a watershed moment for women's hockey. The first time women have ever set foot on the ice at Madison Square Garden. And Billie Jean addressed the players before. Billie Jean King addressed the players before the game. And she referenced it as the most iconic sports facility in the world and to look up at the ceiling because you were you were busting the, the ceiling of the most iconic sports venue in the world gives me chills just thinking about it because it was such an amazing moment and I just felt like we would never turn back from there. To your point though, to be in these iconic venues, to be in big cities where the media exposure is very dramatic and then to have the support of those organizations that are really powerful in the sport of hockey, get really behind it. And I can't say enough about the people who led the march there, who brought their full teams to bear, who did everything they could to make sure these women were treated as, you know, elite athletes. It was just an amazing experience to see. And one thing that really stuck out to me is in the first stoppage of play, they had all the the scrapers that go onto the ice and skate and clean the rink. And in a moment, you just saw all the players look to the side and were like, holy smokes, like these people are out there for us to make these conditions better. It was just a really amazing moment to see, you know, what was happening and where we were going and where we will continue to go. That's fantastic. I just learned something. I never realized that there had never been any type of women's game previously. I would have thought that there would have been some kind of college or even U.S. development. Something played at Madison Square Garden. Never never knew that that was the first and, and only thus far. That's crazy. We're hoping to be able to take a spot in the hallway in one of the most iconic moments for Madison Square Garden dedicated to the women. So yeah. we're working on that. Well, I know Rick Nadu at the New York Rangers. Unbelievable. Who's, uh, he really led the charge. Yeah. he's. Amazing. We've had him on the show. He's been a friend of mine for the last oh, 15 wow. years. He's an awesome guy. And I know he has daughters that play hockey. Yeah. So it's even uh, a personal interest for him to make this a huge success, I'm sure. Yeah, he really took the charge. Really amazing. And helped us with the other clubs that followed. I mean, you can learn a lot, obviously, going through it the first time around. I can't say enough about Rick and what he's done and what he continues to do. He's a real advocate. And the New York Rangers have done a lot on their own in terms of developing programs and signing lead athletes like Amanda Kessel, really creating that representation. Yeah. So, I mean, you guys are equipment, gear for hockey. Obviously, you know, you're very supportive of the game, but through those means, Why was it so important to the game of hockey that this secret Dream Gap Tour be a huge success for a company like Bauer? Well, at Bauer, we believe in everything hockey has to offer, from uh, building character to teaching life lessons to creating lifelong friendships and just creating a sport or offering a sport that people can play for life. You probably know it well, but people play this for the rest of their life, and they become fans of the game. And so if we really believe that, then we believe that for everyone, not just boys, but for girls, for BIPOC communities. It's really about how do we create opportunity using hockey as a vehicle to build good citizens. And it's about whatever level you get to, regardless of whether you ever play after your youth hockey experience. Most people feel that in some ways hockey shapes them as a person. And in the girls' case, over 90% of the women in C-suite positions played sports growing up and mostly team sports. And so we know the impact it can have. And I feel really passionate about providing these opportunities for girls. And Bauer as an organization, we are so fortunate to have leadership and an entire team that shares that passion. 
And so we'll pursue it relentlessly as a way to say we believe as the leaders in our category that we need to make the game accessible for all people. And really, it's it goes beyond doing the right thing. It's also, you know, it will ensure the future of our sport. If we don't make our game more inclusive and diverse, I really feel that we are at risk of the future of the sport. So it's critical that we do that. And, you know, girls represent growth in the sport. And I think it's not only important to get more girls playing hockey, but as importantly, it's it's critical that we get more women in all different roles across the sport to make our sport more inclusive. So women in scouting roles, general manager roles, president roles, acting in all different capacities so that girls have this to aspire to all types of careers, not just playing at the most elite level. Yeah, and I think we're starting to see that. I mean, I mentioned to you before we started the show, we had uh, Manon Rayom on the show, who was uh, the first female to ever sign an NHL contract. And we were talking to her about, I believe, the president of the Flyers right now yeah. is, is a woman. Amazing. And that was the first one. And we're starting to see that skilling. You know, we saw it in the NFL with the first female referee at, at a Super Bowl. We're starting to see it in other sports. And I think it's only a matter of time till we start filtering it through the game of hockey a little bit more too. And I think it starts with things like this secret dream gap tour to show women that there is an option for them in hockey, right? Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, in Philadelphia, it's so incredible to see the immediate impact of making tickets available at a lower cost for so that families can enjoy the game. And not only that, but to create a space for them to gather and make it more of a community efforts across the game to make playing the game more accessible, but if you want to be a fan, to make uh, being part of the sport more accessible. And I think, you know, the more we can branch out in that area, the better it'll be. And I think women are leading in many of these initiatives. So it's great to see across the board, Blake Bolden, a scout for the LA Kings. I mean, the more we see of this, I think it just, again, it goes back to that representation and making our sport more accessible to more people. So I got a question for you because I've asked a couple of folks who are in hockey related roles who, who've been on the show previously. I have this predisposition that hockey people, hockey families are different than other sports. You know, the kids that play it tend to be different. The families that have their kids in it are different. Why do you think that hockey players, hockey families are, you know, to some degree, or maybe you don't think, agree with me, are different than other sports, kids playing Mm -hmm. baseball and soccer and basketball? What is your view on that? Gosh, it's interesting that you bring that up because it's something we're talking about internally a lot right now. All team sports are good for kids, but we really do feel that hockey is different. It's unique and differentiated. I truly believe it's the greatest team sport on earth. And I think some of the differences are, it just seems to be that the team go beyond yourself. You're willing to go beyond yourself. You're willing to put all personal agendas aside for the good of the team. I think you learn this from the time you start the sport. And that's the goodness in the game that we want to keep moving forward is just this idea that there is something bigger than you understanding how important your teammates are. And when you think about different levels, most players are willing to do anything for their teammates. And as a hockey community, we are so strong, so committed. We say with kids, it takes a village. And I think hockey really is that village. The community is that village. It's about the Zamboni drivers, the volunteers, the parents, the coaches, the mentors, all coming together. And if you think about something like Humboldt, which is, you know, one of the greatest tragedies, how the hockey community came together, not only to raise funds for the families, but really to show support. And I'll always remember the sticks out on the doorstep and how people really took to that as a symbol of just saying to all the people that were impacted so tragically, we are with you. I do really think that that is unique and something we should celebrate about hockey, about being different than any other sport. My brother has always said that hockey is a great equalizer. It doesn't matter where you come from, If you're middle class or whatever your upbringing is, when you step on the ice, you're all equal. And and I think which brother said that, by the way, I got to ask you, Mark. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's big about the team aspect and and giving everything for your teammates. So I think hockey has that in spades. And I think people feel that. 
Listen, I agree with you. You know, you bring up humble. That was my kid's first experience. We ended up putting sticks out. I had never been exposed to that. If it was done previously, I, I was unaware of it. And that was like our first inclination or introduction to that. And we've done it. Unfortunately, we've had to do it a couple of times since for other families, for other things that have taken place. But I thought it was a great way to honor people, to show your support with people. And it, it was really, when you were telling the story, I was getting chills just from hearing it again. So. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. And just so you know, we've gotten a couple other answers, which are interesting. One person pointed out that because kids with hockey tend to go away at a very young age, mm -hmm. that sometimes will speed up the maturation process for hockey players in general. And Rick Nadu brought up, I, I believe it was him, brought up a point that it was one of the few sports that the kids all go into a locker room where they yeah. literally go into a locker room typically an hour before there for, you know, half hour or so after because it's taking them time to get undressed. Whereas with soccer or baseball, you throw on some shin guards and you're out on the field. You don't have that extra exposure and camaraderie to get closer with your teammates. So those were some other feedback that we had gotten. Yeah, that's a great comment. You know, when you think of it, when you talk to players that have retired from the NHL or you talk to really any players at any level, whenever the game has changed for them from that level of competition, you think about winning, you think about championships, but you more think about the people that made the journey so great. And you really think about the locker room. I think that's what people miss most is that, again, it's that level of camaraderie that is really difficult to replicate. It just goes so far. And there's like a brotherhood and a sisterhood that really makes it special and unique. So that's a really great point, just the power of the locker room to bring people together. Yeah, that's amazing. So what are the goals for growing women's hockey? What are the goals on the table for you and Bauer to say, hey, this is what's up next. This is how we know yeah. we're doing what we should be with regard to women's hockey. I mean, we need to continue to grow participation. So in Canada, we have a program with the NHL and the NHLPA that welcomes new families into the sport. It's called First Shift. And we've had phenomenal success with that. But this year was really amazing. Even during the pandemic, our participation for girls is up to 40 percent. That's more than double what the governing body's registration is. So we know that if you offer hockey in the right way, it will attract different groups. It'll attract girls. It'll attract different people to our sport, which is so critical. So we want to keep our foot on the gas there. We become the NHL and the NHLPA's partner in the U.S. this fall as well. So we'll look to continue with um, programming that's specifically designed for girls. And then obviously this pro league, like the Dream Gap Tour was a showcase to prove the model that there is a world-class product. And I think we've done that. And so, you know, thinking about coming out of the 22 Olympics, which is the biggest inflection point for participation. I've said this a couple of times, but I think the next day after the gold medal game, we should be announcing the start of a new women's professional league for the 22-23 season. And that will take us a long way because really professional women's hockey is about creating a whole pipeline of girls playing at all different levels that aspire to a different to all different levels, whether that means playing in college, playing pro or pursuing a professional career in any capacity in hockey. So I think those are the things that are really important. But I want to say in addition to women, it's really important that we make our sport more accessible to all people. And that really means focusing on diversity and inclusion and thinking about alternative programs to bring people into the game for some people playing October to March many times a week works great. For a lot of people, it doesn't. And how do we think about that? How do we think about it in climates where there's not as much accessibility to ice, um, making different programs available to them, whether it's through street or roller? How do we focus on BIPOC communities and underserved communities to make sure that they have access and that we're creating programs specifically for them? So in New York, we've partnered with Anson Carter and the New York Rangers to create a pilot in the Bronx that I'm really excited about because it's making hockey more culturally relevant. The on ice component is all about having fun. There's music on the ice. They're playing games, dodgeball and other games to learn skills versus the traditional way of teaching hockey. And off the ice, there's all kinds of programming. There's academic support. There's civic responsibility. There's learning social impact. And beyond that, we see the opportunity to bring other people in um, to make them aware of unconscious bias and how we may be excluding people inadvertently. 
So we have a lot of work to do, but as the leader in our game, we're very committed to it and look forward to continuing around many of these initiatives to make our game more accessible. Yeah, that's great. And maybe the 22 Olympics will be the entree like the 80 Olympics was to men's hockey, at least here in the U.S. It was a huge impetus to people wanting to play and eye-opening to the sport. And I wish you luck and hope that the 22 Women's Olympics is that to women what uh, the 80 Olympics was to men, because I'm sure I don't remember at that time. I was six years old. I'm kind of dating myself, but I was six years old at the time. I was a big Ranger fan. That's kind of what got me into hockey. But maybe it was, you know, maybe it had something to do with me watching the 80 Olympics. Who knows? You know, it it, uh, was there. So you kind of mentioned the Rangers. How are those affiliated with the NHL, the teams and players beyond Anson Carter and the New York Rangers helping to grow this initiative? Are they all on board or some organizations more on board than others to kind of help this out? Or or are you looking to do this league wide or are you trying to be a little bit more strategic about it? Yeah, well, we're just kind of learning that now. But I think a lot of NHL clubs have done a remarkable job in trying to further develop girls programming, not only through learn to play programs, but also through development programs like the St. Louis Blues with their three on three development league that we partner with them on. So I think a lot of the clubs from the NHL and NHLPA perspective, they have the industry growth fund and we partner with them, as I said, on the first shift. So they they fund significant programming specifically for girls. So I think that's, uh, you know, exceptionally helpful And then NHL clubs, like you've seen already, they demonstrated support. Would we think about how they are all on? That's an interesting kind of question because you think about the number of women that could create, you know, maybe you're looking at five teams to keep the level of play really high. Over time, that might change. But so it's interesting to think of the model. Are they based in cities or is it a traveling tour so that all teams could be involved? I think think we need to be open. I think we need to be open to the model open to the type of entertainment that it provides? How do we think about women's hockey in a different way than what the NHL provides? I think those are all opportunities. And I think understanding what's important to sponsors, because women's hockey really represents equality, diversity, and inclusion. And we know that Gen Z and millennials are most interested in companies and brands and experiences where they're aligned with their values and their purpose. And so more than ever in the past, that even exceeds the product itself. So I think it's in the NHL club's best interest, it's in sponsors' best interest to get involved and get on board with the women's hockey, because I think if not, you'll be left behind because people do expect this. Consumers expect more from brands and more from organizations. So I think there's a huge opportunity. And I think for the first time, there's a real readiness to get on board we have the players lined up. So it's been fantastic to see the support. And you've seen the support from NHL players wearing the NHLPA sweatshirts, standing up and supporting the women. And that's really critical that the women have support from their peers at the level that they're at, at the most elite level in the NHL. So it's all starting to come together. Well, some of them are their sisters, right? Absolutely. That's right. <laughs> in a lot of those cases. Yeah. So they, they got to uh, be there for them, right? Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah, it's great. And I agree with you. You know, the more exposure we have for the game, the better. It's just figuring out how to do it. And I, yeah. I think you're right. The next generation of season ticket holders, if you will, for all these organizations have that kind of baseline expectation that they want to be aligned with companies and businesses and sports teams that align with their values. And this kind of initiative helps move them towards that and that next generation of season ticket holder, which is who they ultimately want to continue, right? They need to have those season ticket holders to continue the business and the sport. I'm a big proponent of growing the game. It's something that I've talked about time and time again. A lot of the things you mentioned, barriers to entry, opening it up to others as well. You've talked about it a little bit. Do you feel that this is your responsibility as a corporate entity that is a supplier of gear and a lot of the foundational aspects of the game to do this and to move this thing forward? Yes, we really feel that it is our responsibility to move 
participation for not only for girls, like I said, but for all people to create that opportunity and make our game more accessible, partially because it's critical to the future of the sport. If we stay where we are today, is as much as girls represent growth in the sport, they don't offset the decline in boys' participation in some of the earlier dropout rates. So we need to really get serious at, at looking at what some of the barriers are and breaking those down. We know one thing for sure, right? When we introduce people to hockey, they love it. I see it. It's one of my favorite things to do is to go to a first shift event where, you know, it isn't just a kid with a parent. A lot of times it's grandparents that accompany them as well and siblings and the experience is off the charts. They love it. It's a fun game for those of us that are on the inside. We know that. But how do we make our game more inclusive, more inviting? How do we break down those barriers and make sure that people that are on the outside feel really, truly welcome? And I think it, it means providing a diversity of programming. We need to really think long and hard about how we offer the sport in many different ways to fit with many different lifestyles because there's value no matter how you want to experience hockey. If you truly believe in everything has to offer, hockey has to offer, then you believe in that. So we do take it very seriously, the responsibility. And we also ask all other companies that have any kind of interest in the sport to step up and do the same because I think the collective mission and the collective passion and commitment of leaders in our sport will bring us to a better place. And that's why I'm so thrilled that we're working with the NHL and the NHLPA, the PWHPA, and many of the clubs to continue moving these initiatives forward. Yeah, I mean, not everybody needs to be, like you said uh, somewhat earlier, not everybody needs to be a travel hockey player playing eight, nine months out of the year in order to enjoy and experience the sport. They can play two, three months out of the year like they would any other sport, do it on a recreational level, enjoy it thoroughly, and open themselves the opportunity to really play the sport for the rest of their lives in some way, shape, or form. So I think we need to, you know, there has to be some changes holistically to how things are done because it seems like everything's catered to that year-round hockey player, if you will. And there's not a lot, there's more today than there was 10 years ago, but I still think we need to make some strides in that direction to have those uh, additional options available for people. Totally agree. And just imagine if you did do that, what an impact that'll make on the game. Not only, like we need, the hockey community needs to be reflective of society. And today it's not. Um, We need representation of all different folks so that they feel really served by the community and really supported by the hockey community and enjoying hockey in whatever capacity that works for them. We know the sport has something to offer. So it's just really about getting in there and doing the work. And there's so many organizations that are prepared to help. It's not really about starting anything new. In some cases, it's about providing support or empowering organizations that are doing good work, like the banners in Baltimore like hockey in New Jersey, you know, there's several organizations that are doing so much work to introduce the game to more kids and and particular BIPOC communities and underserved communities. We just need to step in and help support them. Yeah. Do you see women's hockey affecting the direct overall growth of the sport? Now, I understand that if we get a lot more women in, we have participation levels in the sport go up. But do you feel like it's one of those things where a rising tide will raise all ships in terms of women's hockey? How do you see that happening? I, I do think that increasing girls in participation and increasing women's participation across the sport will help all ships rise. I think women bring an interesting perspective to sport and how we offer programming, and that will be incredible across the board. Like I said, I think we need women in leadership positions and seeing the impact that they've made so far, the women that are involved is really a testament to that. So once you open up to different programming, alternate programming, maybe you start with girls, it offers the opportunity to open it up for so many other groups as well. And I think that women have a mindset of working as teams and making a more inclusive environment, and that will be helpful. What do you see as your biggest challenge to make that happen at at current? Well, if I'm honest, it's a lot the way the sport is structured today through the governing bodies, the federations of Hockey Canada and USA Hockey. There's sort of a mandate around how hockey is played. Both are doing 
more work to make the game more accessible and offer it in different ways. But I think we need to move more quickly and we need to create programming like we've talked about. That's Maybe it's one day a week for 10 weeks. Maybe a kid plays that every single year and that's a great opportunity for them. Maybe it's partnering with schools so that kids can play street hockey. That's an entree. And then they can move into ice hockey. We know for the first shift, a lot of kids start on these programs that are, you know, six to 10 weeks and a certain percentage of them, about 30 percent, go on to want to play a lot more. So how can we keep our arms around all those kids that come into the sport and make sure that we have a retention program to keep them playing? And that means programming that looks like what attracted them to the game in the first place. Yeah, I think what, you know, and I'm not going to put words in it. This is me saying this, not you. But I think we have to look at those governing bodies and see, do those governing bodies really reflect that diverse pool of people that we're trying to attract. And from what I know, at least about USA Hockey in particular, it does not. It's folks that may not align with that or even be educated enough to understand what we're talking about and how that's going to help the game. So we may need some changes there as well. But I love the work that you guys are doing in other organizations and the NHL in order to affect these changes, because I think they're important. And like I said, any, you know, I love the sport. If you can't tell by the, you know, the uh, yeah. the inflection in my voice and about, I never did it for a living, but it is something I'm passionate about for myself and my family. And anything that grows the game is awesome to me. So thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. I was going to make one point on the federations that I think is important is they're looking to build world-class teams to compete at the Olympic level and the world championships. But the interesting thing is to be competitive, we need a bigger base. We need to be drawing for a bigger base. So the interesting thing is, even if your target is towards creating these world-class teams, it still behooves you to bring more people into the space. So we more people into the sport. So we have a bigger base to draw from. I will say that both organizations are taking a hard look and making commitments to grow girls hockey and also thinking about how they can make the sport more diverse and inclusive. And we need to partner together with them. And we are in those conversations and working very closely. So I have a lot of faith that things will continue to progress and we'll be in a much different place when hopefully we can talk again next year. Great. Yeah. Listen, I'm all about an abundance mindset, right? The more people we have, the the abundance, the better off you're going to be because You might get some strategic byproducts that may show themselves through that process. Not everybody peaks at the age of eight or nine in in a sport. (laughs) You know, they might need some time to develop till 15, 16, 17. And I think kids get overlooked in that regard. And there are many different paths to get where you want to go. And they may not all lead to the NHL. And that's it's fine. Okay. You know, yeah, that's it's okay. all right. And people have to understand that. Well, listen, Mary Kay, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. We end every show with asking every guest the same question, which is, what did you do today that brought you joy and put you in the right mindset for success? This is the Midland Money Mindset. So, Yeah, that's such an awesome question. A couple of days a week, I read emails that come in from people that are inspired by some of the programming that we've done. So it's just this whole positivity thing. And I received an email from a parent whose daughter was inspired by the work we've been doing with the PWHPA that was sitting watching the women play at Madison Square Garden and just what an impact it had on her daughter, how it made her feel that her daughter could actually dream to play pro hockey one day. I find that really inspiring. And our team at Blaineville, our engineers, do a lot of work for people that nobody hears about, but it's people who may have complications wearing gear and they they make custom gear, whether it's for veterans or kids who have had issues with their limbs. And I read a story about, you know, our team built a a glove, a custom glove for a little boy, could finally get on the ice and hold a stick. So those types of stories really make me think about why we do what we do and why I love being part of the Bauer team. Great, Mary Kay. That'll get you fired up, I'm sure, and have, you know, make me want to have a huge success for the day. That's for sure. So if people want to find you, we'll have this in the show notes, but if people want to find you, learn more about Bauer and, and your initiatives, what's the best place for them to go? Probably the best place is on LinkedIn, maybe. I'm on LinkedIn, and we uh, Bauer's on LinkedIn as well, so they can see 
a lot of things there. I try to keep it up to speed, probably not as much as I need to, but I can also go to Bauer.com. In the not too distant future, we'll be launching a new uh, page there that talks about our cause-related initiatives. So I think that'll be great. And obviously our social channels, we post a lot about our different initiatives and share stories on Instagram, particularly around what we're doing with girls and women's and also all our different cause-related initiatives. Great. Well, thank you, Mary Kay, for being a guest. I appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedule to join us and make it a great day. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. I want to thank Mary Kay Messier for being a guest on the Midland Money Mindset. Hockey is something that I am passionate about. And as you can see from our conversation, Mary Kay and Bauer show a similar passion as well. Mary Kay's role in growing the game of hockey, not only in the U.S., but internationally, is instrumental and only the beginning. I am looking forward to watching the growth of the game with her leading the charge at Bauer. Mary Kay can be found across all social media platforms, and all the contact information needed to find her can be found in the show notes. Thank you for joining us this week on the Midland Money Mindset. Make sure you visit our website at midlandfinancial.com and be sure to smash the subscribe button so you don't miss a show. We encourage you to help others find our valuable content. And listen, please don't keep us a secret. You can also schedule an Is There a Fit call right from our website or by using the link that you'll find in the description section of your podcast player or app. Be sure to join us for our next episode to learn more about the mindset needed to successfully plan for and live your best life before and through retirement. The opinions voiced in the Midland Money Mindset Show with Lawrence Sprung are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. No strategy ensures success or protects against loss. To determine what may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, financial or tax advisor prior to investing. Investment advisory services offered through CWM LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor. Guests on the Midland Money Mindset Show are not affiliated with CWM LLC.